the homeopathic treatment of anorexia and bulimia nervosa. So I uh, wanted to do um, something on eating disorders for you guys. Um, somebody in our group said, well, you know, bikini season is coming and uh, bathing suit season is coming. And uh, so thoughts are turning to how do I look? And especially now that we've been all incarcerated for the last 12 weeks, um, and we've all seen the before and after memes of uh, somebody with uh, a six pack and then after a uh, pandemic uh, looking very fat and all that. But uh, not to make light of it, this is a very serious disorder. It's actually life-threatening if uh, if it goes too far. And um, we thought it would be an interesting one for you. Normally at For Homeopathy Canada, we like to do things that are more acute, more uh, acute illnesses, things that come very quickly and go quickly. Anorexia and bulimia are things that, uh, something that can stay with you for many, many years. But I think another thrust of this talk is for you to start understanding, for those of you who are new to homeopathy, that the approach to homeopathy and the remedies themselves are all the same. The way you approach a case, no matter what the disease or what the disorder, is very similar uh, all the time. And the remedies are the remedies. They do what they do. And so um, if you have anxiety before an exam or you have an uh, anxiety because you just got a bad diagnosis by your doctor, it doesn't matter. Anxiety is anxiety and the remedy will probably be the same if we can match everything up. So let's do it now with uh, anorexia and bulimia nervosa. So those of you who have seen a few of my lectures know that I uh, like to always give you, uh, especially when I do something that's in the psychiatry psychology realm, I like to give you some background into what the allopathic or the medical, the traditional meth, uh, medical version of the disorder is. And this is the Holy Bible for psychiatry and psychology, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So let's have a quick look at what they say about what categorizes an eating disorder, what makes you uh, the diagnosis viable. So it's characterized by a persistent disturbance of eating, persistent. Remember, we've, you've seen my lectures on anxiety. It's the same thing with all psychiatric disorders. It can't be just a one-off. It has to be around for a little while. So it's a persistent disturbance of eating or eating-related behavior that results in the altered consumption or absorption of food. And the reason for the absorption is we have disorders like Pika, which is when you have, for example, a desire to eat chalk or nails or all sorts of crazy things. Uh, and so it encompasses those as well. Also, what's important for a psych psychiatric disorder is that there has to be a significant impairment in the physical health or psychosocial social, social functioning. So if the person is having this and they're bopping along and nothing has really changed in their life, you may not get diagnosed with it because there has to be some evidence that it is impeding you in your life. So let's go straight to it, to anorexia nervosa. Well, not exactly straight to it, because if you know me as well, I like to do a history of something. So let's just get into the origins of anorexia nervosa, because if we understand where something comes from in the past, uh, just like homeopathy, it is what it is, the remedies are the remedies, the approach is the approach, the disorder is the disorder. And whether it came in the 13th century or the 21st century, there's going to be something that binds it together right? And we're going to need to really understand where it comes from in its roots in order to understand it in the present. So before we get to that history part, let's just do some epidemiology, some statistics. So 95% of sufferers are between 12 and 25 years old. And I was shocked to read this. 25% of college age women try to control their weight through binging and purging. So I, 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 this is a relatively recent statistic, but I, th I have a feeling if we got one that's even more today, I think uh, a lot of people are, are more uh, aware of nutrition and of working out. But still, that's a very high percentage. Women are far more likely to develop an eating disorder than men who comprise five to 15%. Um, and I'm gonna be trying to be sensitive to, uh, there's this whole thing going now with JK Rowling, if you know, if you've been reading about uh, uh, binary and uh, transsexual and, and all that. Uh, I'm going to use the words he and she, uh, but I am sensitive to uh, men who identify as women and women who identify as men. I just wanna put that in there. 20% uh, 20 of people with anorexia nervosa die prematurely from complications, including suicide and cardiac problems. So uh, it's almost the same thing, same thing with cancer, not that cancer won't kill you, but often, you know, the treatment will kill you. In this case with anorexia, the, the sequelae, the, the things that happen, the concomitants that happen as a result of having these disorders, those are the things that usually will kill you. 
So this is a very horrible picture, but I wanted you to see that this is the reality of what we're dealing with. This is why it is a very serious disorder. So here's that history I was talking about. So the concept of starving yourself intentionally, it's not something that just came, you know, a lot of us became aware of, uh, of uh, anorexia nervosa about the 1980s. Uh, but it's no, it's not something that just appeared out of nowhere in the 1980s. There is uh, historical evidence of it, but there are three different reasons why people, and especially women, chose to starve themselves. And the first one we'll talk about is from the 13th to the 16th century, and this is religious piety. So back in those days, it was not about material things, it was about God god-fearing people and so uh, there was a tendency to fast to eat as little as possible to survive just on the wafer and the wine that was enough to keep you going and if you were able to do that it was emblematic of the fact that you were closer to jesus you were closer to god you were able to sacrifice your bodily needs in order to attend to the spiritual so that was a choice that these people made to to not eat right so the the uh the not eating, the anorexia, came from a desire to show themselves to be holy, worthy of sainthood. Then uh, as the centuries went along, it no longer became just about your choice to deprive yourself of food, but rather it was something that was thrust upon you through evil intentions, through the work of Satan or evil delusion or possession, right? Uh, being uh, de de demonized. So uh, they would renunciate food, they would give up food that was seen as uh, even insane. So before we had a choice to give up food in order to appear closer to God, to be more of a, of a saint-like person, and now we have somebody who has it imposed upon them by something like Satan. That was the reason for them not eating. That was the interpretation given by the medical people of the day, why this young woman wasn't eaten. Of course, she was possessed, she was a witch. And then you have a third one, which is called the anorexia mirabilis, which is miraculously inspired loss of appetite, where these women and some men didn't eat, but they were fine. They went about their business. They were never hungry. And this was seen as a gift bestowed upon them by God. And this spanned from the 13th and the 19th centuries. Now we come into the 19th century, and now we're getting into what? The Industrial Revolution, right? Uh, we're starting to see a shift, if you think about artwork from that time, from the Gothic to the more, uh, to the Renaissance, where things became more fleshy. And then you have this uh, Victorian era where there's um, uh, a, a shift away from God and towards the material. Okay, it's a more bourgeois lifestyle. Remember, now you see the picture here, there's also the advent of what was called the daguerreotype, daguerreotype, which was the first so people are starting to have photos of themselves in the house. They're able to see what they look like all the time. It's not just passing, you know, a, a past a mirror or something. Uh, people can look at you and they can judge you. And there's also the advent of all of these, uh, you know, clothing stores. And there's greater money. There's greater wealth. And there's a there's different case. There's different. Um, uh, levels in society of how much money you have. And look at the clothing on this woman on the bottom. You see the heaviness of the robe. Um, that is very much against, if you know anything about art history, you know, the black, thin, gray uh, aestheticism of the Gothic period. And now we're getting into the Renaissance and then in, into the 19th century where things are heavy, the heavy cloak, the thick of velour, the, the fatness of it. So this is, women started to become more self-aware of what their body looked like. So in that 19th century, the, uh, we all know that the British family ascribes to homeopathy, uh, but this uh, Sir William Gull was the physician to the Queen. Uh, homeopathy uh, may not have taken play, uh, been entrenched in England at that point. And he coined the term anorexia nervosa. And uh, it's an important distinction because it used to be called anorexia hysterique. And hysteria comes from the Latin, from the Greek of womb. And so it used to be called the hysterique to identify the fact that it was mostly women that were affected. But by calling it nervosa, it was an understanding that it could affect men and women and it was an affection of the nervous system and not emanating from the womb. So I found a case for you that he described. So this was a woman, a young girl, actually 17 years old, 
all of 82 pounds at five foot five. And you take a good look at this picture of her. I mean, her head can't even, she can't even hold her head up because she has no, no stamina. 82 pounds for five foot five is exceedingly thin. Black circles under the eyes, pinched lips. Look at the eyes, they're kind of dull. They're not really focusing on anything. So he treated her and four years later, another portrait was done of her. And he says, as she recovered, she had a much younger look corresponding to her age, 21. So here she's four years older and yet look how much healthier she looks. The cheeks are filled out, the head is straight up, the hair has grown, it looks lustrous, velvety, shiny. The eyes have purpose and focus. So this is the difference between somebody with anorexia nervosa and someone who has recovered from it. Now we come into the 20th century. And this is when wider public awareness began. As I said, in the 1970s, for me, it was the 1980s. I had somebody in my high school who came back from summer vacation noticeably thinner, and that's when it, I became aware of it. Uh, the starving disease started appearing in the popular press. That's what they used to call it. And in Science Digest in May 1970, they reported on a morbid aversion to eating in adolescent girls. And if you're able, if you have a big enough screen, I'm gonna read it to you. Women who died until death and why. This is the actual uh, May 1970 Science Digest that uh, started to popularize the concept of anorexia nervosa. And you notice how they focus on uh, adolescent girls because that's where it often starts. And then a very important book in 1978, Houston psychiatrist Hilda Brooks, she wrote this golden age cage, the enigma of anorexia nervosa. And with that book, it became more in the public um, consciousness, this, this illness. And it was, uh, as I said, the alarming rate at which the disorder was growing. So we'll talk a little bit about why all of a sudden, why, what was the zeitgeist? What was, the, what was going in the time in the 1970s and 1980s that allowed for it to grow the way it did? One way was through Saturday Night Live. Uh, they did a sketch, in, a sketch in 1984 featuring the Anorexia Cookbook was just enough to let you know that um, they were already lampooning it. So it was in the popular awareness. But if you look at Gilda Radner here and you see how entirely skinny she was, the entire cast was that way. And I had seen a documentary on the making of SNL and they talked about this skinny culture that existed there, that one of them was very skinny and then the rest of them looked at themselves on TV and said, I can't look like this compared to her. And it just became a terrible culture there of extreme thinness. And then what else made it rife for the anorexia nervosa to perpetuate in the 70s and 80s? Well, what's happening? We have a lot of color TV. We have easy access to TV, lots of movies, easy access to magazines, easy access to uh, radio. And we start to develop this kind of, hero, but there's always been hero worship of popular people, of, you know, movie stars in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. But now we have popular culture everywhere and so easy access to it. And these people don't want, they feel that they look better being skinny. And young, impressionable girls especially are looking at these magazines, looking at these TV shows, and seeing these very popular people and thinking, well, they're, they got to be on TV and I don't see anybody overweight there. Maybe this is something that I need to be in order for me to have my own self-identity as a popular, uh, attractive person. And then we come into the, uh, more in the 20th century, we have uh, the death of Karen Carpenter. And that's really, really when it hit home to a lot of people. Uh, and you see her on the left, uh, certainly one of the purest singing voices in the history of uh, music. Um, she uh, performed with her brother. They were extremely popular. And then you could see what happened as she became more and more self-aware of her image. And she literally um, died from anorexia nervosa in 1983, cardiac complications. So we can see how dangerous it is. And now we have in the 21st century, uh, we have somebody like Kate Moss. Uh, uh, there, you know, I remember there's a Family Guy episode where she supposedly guest starring on it and she turns sideways and you see nothing. She goes like, she's like, you know, she goes sideways and there's nothing there and she falls through the cracks of the, of the wood floor. And uh, the famous line, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. Um, if you go to um, websites devoted to anorexia nervosa, uh, the culture that's there, the, the, the people who are on there to convince themselves that what they're doing is a, a smart thing to be doing. This is one of their mantras. So, now that we've looked at the past, and now we've also brought it into the future, 
are these two disparate concepts? Do they have nothing to do with one another? We had this religious asceticism in the 13th century, and then we have the 21st century uh, bourgeois lifestyle worry about physical appearance. Are they, in fact, separate things, or are they interrelated? Well, I think they're interrelated, and what brings them together is the concept of perfectionism. In both cases, you have perfectionism as the etiology, the driving force behind the anorexia nervosa, right? So in the earlier centuries, the deliberate control of appetite was linked to Catholicism, to God, a means of striving for perfection in the eyes of God. Bring it now into the modern era, and I'm going backwards, sorry about that. And I hit something wrong, so I've lost my screen. There we go. Sorry about it, everybody. You're going to have to suffer through these while I click through them. We were on a roll there. All right, we're almost there. OK, two more. All right, so we talked about the um, perfectionism and the religious asceticism. And then in the 20th century, the self-starver -star strives for perfection, not towards God, but in terms of society's ideal of physical rather than spiritual beauty. And that has been the progress of humankind over all of these 800 centuries, away from God and towards fleshy, earthly bound concerns. All right, so let's operationally define anorexia so we understand, then we make sure that we understand what we are actually studying. So it's from the late 16th century, from the Greek an, which is out, without, so the A in front tells you that it's uh, without, and orexis is appetite. So it means a, uh, an absence of appetite. Now, as for the homeopaths out there, we know that when we use a rubric or a symptom for a patient to put into our charts of anorexia, it means that they've lost their appetite. But the question I'm going to ask you is, are those suffering from anorexia nervosa without appetite? And to the contrary, sufferers of anorexia nervosa tend to be preoccupied with thoughts of food, they constantly count calories, and they structure their lives around the avoidance or the control of food. So either on the one hand, they're just completely trying to not think about it and stay away from it, but often would, uh, and I've had patients like this where they've actually become in charge of the entire kitchen. Uh, they are so obsessed with food, they want to they want to feed other people, but they just will not eat it themselves. They will be in charge of the pantry, they'll do the shopping, they'll do the cooking. Actually, the cooking is good because it uses up calories, you're standing up, you're chopping. So they are actually quite obsessed with food. So it's not suddenly a lot. When you think of somebody who's sick and who's lost their appetite, they're not thinking about food. They're doing everything they can not to think about food because it's probably making them sick to even think about it. But it's the opposite with anorexia nervosa. So let's just get into a definition from the psychiatric book of what anorexia nervosa is. It's restriction of energy intake, which is food, right, relative to requirements leading to a significantly low body weight. So everybody has a certain amount of calories they need to take in every day and to uh, keep that in without working it off in order to maintain their body weight. And this is a huge restriction of it leading to significant low body weight. Accompanied with that is this intense fear of gaining weight that has to be a part of it or of becoming fat. Persistent behavior that interferes with weight gain even though at a significantly low weight. So even though they are aware that they are grossly underweight, they have such a fear of putting on even an ounce that they engage in behaviors that interferes with weight gain. There's also a disturbance in the way they see themselves. That's called body dysmorphia. So the disturbance in the way in which one's body weight or shape is experienced with undue influence of body weight or shape on self-evaluation or persistent lack of recognition, recognition of the seriousness of the current low body weight. And as you see in the picture, uh, the woman is exceedingly thin, but when she looks in the mirror, this is what she sees. So this, this dysmorphia, this inability to appreciate what she actually looks like, and this emphasis on uh, parts of the body being 
um, out of proportion to what they actually are. So you'll often see them. We have some symptoms in our material and our uh, repertories about, uh, you know, belief that the pelvis is too, too big or that the arm bones are too long. So there's this, they look in the mirror and what they see is not what we see. Uh, just for uh, all of you, everybody knows body mass index, so I put this in here. So just to give you kind of a, a marker against which you can, you know, you know your own body uh, mass index. I think I think between what is it, 20, uh, 20 to something is is very healthy. So a mild case of uh, anorexia is uh, at around seventeen, and then the more severe uh, the disorder, the lower the body mass index goes. You can imagine at fifteen how skinny you must be. Now, what are some of the behaviors? So this is for uh, you as a homeopath, or even if you're wondering if somebody in your social circle or in your family is exhibiting kind of that. It's not like they're going to go around and tell you, uh, especially if they start wearing bulky clothes. So you can always look, always for any kind of disorder, always look for changes in patterns, something out of the ordinary that doesn't jive with your experience with that person. So again, that extreme focus on food, and they make excuses not to join in meals. They may only eat alone. So let's say you're a parent out there and you've got a, uh, a teenager, and all of a sudden the teenager, every single day, is not available for supper. Okay, and they, and they come up with plausible excuses. Well, there might be something more going on because they don't want to join you for the family meal. Another one is if they do join you for the family meal, they might cut the food into tiny pieces or other rituals. And as the, in order to do that, they, so they eat extremely slowly, right? So if you cut it into small pieces, you know, by the time the meal ends in 15 minutes, let's say maximum, they've only eaten a small, tiny proportion. I call you kind of call it the... Um, uh, Big Bang Theory effect, if you ever uh, watch it, uh, the way that they take their fork and they just kind of play with the food back and forth because, of course, they're filming the show and they can't keep eating. So it makes it look like they're eating, but they're not. So that's another kind of behavior you might see in somebody. They hide the food to prevent that they've eaten it. So uh, all of a sudden, uh, whoop, onto the napkin, you know, with it, when you're not looking, it gets thrown onto there. They lie about having eaten, just like I said in, in the first one, or just other times of the day. Come, it's lunchtime. Come have a snack. We're all having brownies and milk. No, no, no. I, I, I already ate. I, I ate a ton at 3 o'clock. I couldn't possibly eat another mouth, mouth, a mouthful. Now, did anyone see them eat at 3 o'clock? No. And as I said, they can often wear layers of clothing, both because of the loss of body fat, so there's nothing keeping them warm, and also to hide the severe weight loss, which is one of the real tragedies of this, because one of the reasons they do it is to, in their mind, look good, right? To be thin and look good. But then they had covered up because they are so thin that they know that if anyone looks at them, their, mouth, their jaws will fall to the floor. And so the whole purpose of doing it, it is no longer... It's gone from looking good to an entirely different reason for doing it at that point. Now, what are some of the behaviors uh, and some of the things that we'll notice with it? Now you'll see with uh, adolescents and children, uh, they fail to meet certain markers that they're expected to do. So that might be one way for you to know that there might be some anorexic behavior going on. Now, uh, the nutritional compromise affects most major organ systems and can produce a variety of disturbances. I'm reading that to you. But if I could make, if I were going to make a list to you, I was going to make a list of all the body, you know, systems that anorexia could, could affect. But if I were to do that, I could spend like, you know, 10 screens because when you deprive yourself of nutrition, one of the basic things that you need in order to survive, it's going to affect every single bodily system. Now there's some obvious ones, like you'll see the, 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 the um, loss of a period, for, for example, in girls, because that uh, when you don't have enough fat uh, in your body, that's going to affect it. You're going to see hair falling out. There's some very obvious ones, but then you get to the very, very more serious ones, like the cardiac arrhythmias and uh, things like that, when it becomes extremely serious. There's also depression that could be a cause or a concomitant, and there could be social withdrawal. So um, you might have a teenager who all of a sudden stops wanting to meet with their friends. And I'm going to give you three scenarios, if I can remember them, um, where why and I'm telling why I'm telling you it's important is because we are doing a homeopathic discussion of anorexia. And it's not enough to have these very common symptoms when we take the case. It's not enough just to hear that the person's not eating and they're doing what every other anorexic is doing. What we need to understand is why did it start? Where did it start? And sometimes we can tease that out through their current behaviors. So if you have a teenager or somebody who suddenly 
is no longer getting together with friends. Well, one reason might be is because they go visit with their friends and the friend said, oh my God, you've lost so much weight. You look horrible. Why are you doing this? You're making your parents so upset. Da, 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 da. And this person doesn't want to be around anybody who is criticizing them. So a sensitivity to criticism becomes an important thing for a homeopath to understand as part of their totality of symptoms and part of the whole picture to help us find the remedy. Because we have a lot of remedies to help with anorexia nervosa, but we need to understand some of the characteristic traits of the person to help narrow down. So being um, uh, anathema, they don't want to have any reproaches, they, don't, they, they uh, are afraid to get yelled at, that is an important thing for us to understand. We find a remedy where uh, a, a, a lack of desire to be reproached, a fear of being reproached, uh, ailments from being reproached is very important. Another situation, and now it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna leave me. Um, for example, or they could have somebody in their group of friends who is effortlessly thin. She eats anything she wants all the time, never exercises, and never weighs more than 102 pounds. Well, that could be ailments from jealousy and she doesn't want to hang around them for that reason. Or it could be someone who um, wants to be lauded for their effort and they go to their friends and she doesn't get the lauding that she wants. She doesn't get the, wow, look at you, you look amazing. And that could be that uh, she needs to be uh, complimented all the time. She needs to be feel that she's higher than everybody else and that's not happening. So we see three etiologies here of trying of social withdrawal and it's very important to tease out which one is the motivation for the social withdrawal. It's not enough just to have to know that the person is stopping to see their friends. So these are some of the things that come along with anorexia nervosa, their insomnia, diminished libido for the older people, obsessive compulsive thoughts, that's not surprising considering how they're thinking about food all the time, uh, strong desire to control one's environment, and we're gonna talk about that a lot because it ties in with that concept of perfectionism. Excessive levels of physical activity, and that's an odd one, and that's something I even found in case studies I saw from the uh, 19th century, that despite the fact that they're not getting sufficient nutrition into them, they are full of energy to do exercise all the time because any bit of movement they do do means loss of calories. And it will also help us find a remedy because not everyone with anorexia nervosa will have that excess energy, but the ones that do will point to a remedy that has excess energy. Another, uh, so the reason remember we saw that it starts like 13 to 25, well, what's going around on around that time? Puberty, that's a real, real strong etiology of anorexia nervosa because what's happening to that very you know the girl with the boy's body that suddenly becomes a woman you know the the, the breasts develop the hips go out a bit of fat uh, accrues around the the belly uh that could be a shock to some people uh there could be comments or criticism about their appearance we talked about that in terms of social isolation there could be a depression or anxiety that that uh, happened there could be a desire for seeking attention. That's the reason that they do it. Nobody is noticing me. Uh, and in the opposite side of it, they do it because they feel they're getting too much attention, maybe abusive attention. We'll talk about that. And they want to disappear. That's another reason for it. Drug addiction and alcoholism is, is of course, uh, an etiology of it. It's certainly with drug addiction, you lose the appetite very easily. And heredity could be a part of it too. It does run in families sometimes moving to a new school or city. That could be a very big cause of it. Uh, you have no control over your situation. You have to leave all your friends and you have to meet new ones and make a whole new life for yourself. That could be the cause of it, a desire to control your environment when you have no say in something. Death of a loved one, again, you had no control in somebody dying and you could be in grief over, over the loss. There could be a history of abuse or other trauma and it could be a form of self-punishment. In other words, I don't deserve that cookie. I don't just, would, you know, what starts as I don't deserve that second piece of cake becomes I don't deserve that piece of cake, to I don't deserve that cookie, to I don't deserve that a fraction of a cookie, to I don't deserve lunch, to I don't deserve supper. So you can see how it can cascade down. So now we're going to get into some of the remedies for homeopathy, and this is what you've been waiting for, I'm assuming. So this is a chart that we create. Now, anorexia nervosa is not, it's called a clinical symptom. It's not something that was determined when they were 
understanding how the remedies work. They did something called provings. They gave them to healthy people and they developed symptoms. This is a disorder. They didn't give them a remedy to the point that they would develop a disorder. So this is clinical data from people who've come in to see homeopaths and they have noticed that these remedies have been helpful for these patients. And there's some very familiar ones for people out there, Ignatia, Sulfur, Sacalb is one we're gonna talk about. That's sugar, if you can believe it. So uh, Arsenicum and Natmer, we're gonna talk about all of these. So the first one we're gonna talk about is Natra Muriatica. And I'm gonna to talk to you about a book called Homeopathic Psychology, which, oh, and I don't have it here with me, but uh, it's a very interesting book that talks about the remedies from uh, the position of a psychologist and who's also a homeopath. And he says that anorexia nervosa typically is seen in teenagers, teenagers with controlling parents, we talked about that, who care more about their appearances and their, uh, care more about appearances and their child's feelings. So you have the controlling parent, the child feels that she has no say in what's going on in her family. And to make matters worse, parents and very often the mother noticing that the child is wasting away and instead of saying what's going on with you i'm worried about you says how could you look like that we're going to so-and-so's for dinner next week and how can i present you to them not a very pleasant scenario for the child the anorexic individual uses eating or rather not eating as her sole mean of exerting control over her life and then he goes on to talk about low self-esteem and it's made worse by admiring models and actors who represent a body ideal to which she feels she can never live up equating body fat with being ugly. So here we have actually a melding of the 13th century and the 21st century because yes, in the old days, they looked up to God as the perfection of the, as the ideal, but admiring somebody looking up to somebody, hero worshiping, worshiping somebody, doesn't have to be a God, a deity, a Jesus. It could also be in the mind of a young girl, an actor or a singer. And so that's from the 13th century. And then they bring in the physical need for perfectionism by equating themselves with being ugly because their body is not up to snuff. And then because she feels ugly, she must therefore be fat, which then distorts her ability to see her body with accuracy, seeing fat where ribs really actually protrude. So if you have a patient, if you have, know somebody who follows this kind of um, mindset, these, these kind of mind symptoms, natural muriatica might be a very good remedy for you. And in fact, uh, Philip Bailey, who wrote this, says that uh, the majority of his, of his anorexic patients actually do very well with uh, natural muriatica as at least one of their remedies. Now we'll go on to carcinocyanum. Now carcinocyanum is what we call a nosode. It is made from a tissue that has disease. In this case, it's cancer. And so what do we see in patients who need carcinocyanum? Now remember, even though we're talking about anorexia nervosa, this is true for any kind of person who walks around with these kind of symptoms. They would do well with carcinocyanum. So we see this perfectionism. That's a very key point of uh, carcinocyanum, this fastidiousness, which means things need to be in their place. They need to be perfect. If they're not where they are, it bothers the person. They need to put it just so. There's control and responsibility. Okay. There's this fear of becoming fat that came up in the symptoms. There's a fear of projection. There's always a need to please. And if we can think of one central mind symptom of carcinocyanum, it's this need to get approval. And someone who needs to get approval is not doing something that they want for themselves. They're doing what somebody else wants for them. And so they are relinquishing, relinquishing control from themselves to somebody else. And they are making themselves almost like a, like a dog, right? Who, to, who just... Uh, kneels next to the master and just allows anything to happen to them because he doesn't want to lose the approval of the master. So that will often result in a uh, suppressed anger, okay? Because even though they're trying to get approval and it's their choice, the reality is this is not what they want and there is some anger component. 
And there's also this responsibility too early. You see this in like latchkey kids where the parents ask them, maybe there's a, a six year, eight year difference between them and, and the next child. Maybe there's a two year difference. It doesn't matter. And the parent takes advantage of the older child and has them come home from school and open the door for everybody and give a snack to the younger one and supervise their homework and maybe do make supper as well. These are the kind of people who often need Carson assignment. Domination by others, rudeness of others. Ailments from abuse, grief, or fears often related to weight. This is some of the reasons why you might choose carcinosinum in anorexia nervosa for these patients. And they have that workaholic, right? They've been given all these assignments, at, uh, right, from their parents or from teachers or whatever, which they want approval. So they just work their hearts out. And then if they take a rest, they feel guilty. And we talked a bit about that with the anorexic patient who likes to work out a lot. They feel guilty. If they stop, they might gain weight. So this is somebody who might benefit from carcinocyanum. Phosphoric acid I chose because it's a remedy often given to teenagers, especially those who have suffered some sort of a loss, whether they've moved from home or they've lost a loved one or a loved possession or a loved pet. Uh, you'll see this loss of appetite with great weakness and lethargy. Now, the acid remedies have something in common to them, and they have debility. In this case, it's very marked to the point of prostration, to the point of complete and utter indifference. And the origin of it is this grief pining away with loss of appetite and emaciation, and that sounds a lot like anorexia to a great extent. In the second stage, they get indifferent. That's the hallmark. We talked about approval for carcinocyanum, for phosphoric acid. The hallmark word is indifference to all emotions and food. One of the famous symptoms of it is a lying in bed with the face against the wall. The energy, the desire to engage with the world so uh, diminished that they can't even bring themselves to face away from the wall. So it's a great remedy also for people who, uh, young people who grow rapidly. Sometimes we use physiological uh, markers to, to help. To, uh, we don't use it to choose the remedy, but we might use it to confirm the remedy. And they are stretched both mentally and or physically. So this prostration from grief, working too hard, too much work at school, phosphoric acid can be excellent. In fact, I gave it to somebody during COVID and uh, a young uh, person and it worked very, very well. So there's an order in acids about what comes first. Um, when you see that the mental debility comes first and then it's followed by a physical downfall, as you see in anorexia nervosa, you can think to phosphoric acid. Now we're going to look at tarantula, which is, uh, it's a spider remedy, and it's not something that we would automatically think about for anorexia nervosa, but when, when you think about it, Richard Pitt's a very interesting uh, author. He did this wonderful Materia Medica uh, comparative one, where he compares the remedies and why you would eliminate, why would, you know, this one's similar to this, but this is why you would choose this one, but this is why you would choose the other one. And he goes, in the spider remedies, people don't want to put, uh, to put on weight. They want to feel light, empty, and activity keeps their weight down. Think of a, a spider who has to be very um, uh, sly and not be found, right? Do, 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 Well, if you're crunching on leaves, you're gonna be hurt, aren't you? If you're nice and slender, you're not gonna be hurt. So they tend to pick at food, rarely eating bet uh, between full meals, and therefore the spider remedies are some of the best to consider for anorexia. Now we talked earlier about this religious mania, remember the adherence to God. Uh, so there's this self-punishment, fast in order to appease God, but I put also to impress someone because worship, hero worship is hero worship. And behind all of this is guilt. So you tend to see very restless and hyper-energetic people. These are the anorexics who never seem to get tired. They can work out all the time. Think to spider remedies. Then we have platina. So we, now we have a mineral remedy. Now, platina is platinum. And what is platinum? It's one of the most precious metals. So not surprisingly, some of the symptoms that come up in people who need platina reflect the fact that there is this, I am precious. I am worth a lot. I am better than you. So not surprisingly, in the platina patient, anorexic patient, there's an obsession with how she looks to others. There's an arrogance in platina, there's a haughtiness, and it's reflected in feeling superior. For anorexics, it could be for being thinner than somebody else, right? I'm better than you, or I have better self-control than you do because I am able to go uh, 22 hours a day without eating, and then I have my two pieces of lettuce and I'm satisfied. 
in Platina, we see a struggle, and it really is the perfect remedy bringing together the 13th century with the 21st, because in Platina, that central uh, emotional struggle is between the desire to both be pious and also to be sexual. There's that constant tension between piety and sexuality, between adherence to God and the desires of the flesh. And it's how they deal with that tension that those two polar opposites uh, cause upon each other. That is the tension in Platina. And so we see in Platina, to me, it is the perfect anorexic, uh, anorexia nervosa remedy because it brings together the history with the present. And also restriction of the pleasures of food parallels restrictions of the pleasures of the flesh. Now we have Arsenicum album. Uh, it's a wonderful remedy. Uh, a lot of people are using it for COVID. In it, you see a lot of, again, perfectionism and fastidious. They're, they're one of the most fastidious remedies in all of the Armateria Medica. It's not that things just, you know, things are a little messy in here. It's just, I need to get it straight. I can't concentrate unless I get it straight. There's control at all costs. And you see that a lot in anorexic. And then there's um, a great fear for their health in our setting in our setting commandment. They're very, very nervous, anxious people. And so you can imagine that um, they might, as the disease progresses, they can feel that if I eat this, there might be poison in it. They might create a delusion that the food is poison and that is their justification for not eating. So that there's a fear of germs and getting diseases. So they're generally anxious, restless people who want to may remain in control at all times. Uh, and now I have another one. I, I decided to add this one, uh, Slack Caninum. I wanted to introduce you, if you don't know about them, to the lack remedies. Lack uh, implies uh, milk, right? Uh, those, uh, and so we have a whole series, we have a whole bunch of remedies made from different um, animals. We have from humans as well, we have from cats, we have from, from camels, from dolphins, and from goats, you name it. We have it from the cows. This is, comes from a dog. So I alluded a bit before to a dog when I talked about carcinocinum, this, this desire to please, to subjugate yourself in order to gain approval. And so uh, also we have, and, and we'll talk about that in just one or two points, but you also have, they hate their body and can often be found to have anorexia or, or bulimia. So there is this, um, uh, you know, I felt like a dog, right? Something like a dog implies that it's lesser than, you're a few rungs below human society. And so there's this lack of self-appreciation and uh, a feeling of self-loathing that you see in that caninum. They have also a fear of losing control. Uh, she attempts to keep herself under strict control. And I read a very interesting etiology for this fear of losing control with Farouk Master, who's a very well-known homeopath in uh, India. And he talked about uh, the fact that dogs are by nature, right? They come from wolves. They come from uh, mammals that are very, very feral in nature. They're very, uh, they're wild and they kill other animals but they have been domesticated and they live now with humans and they got it pretty good, don't they, right? They get their tummy rubs and they get their soft pillow beds and they get food brought to them all the time and they get hugs and kisses. And so there is this strain between being this feral animal that wants to lunge at your neck and also being domesticated. So there's this fear of losing control that came up in the proving of this uh, remedy, and you see that in the people needing it. That low self-confidence is a hallmark of it and a fear of failure. And often the root of this is a history of abuse. This is one of the prime remedies for history of abuse, whether it's physical or sexual or emotional. Uh, you know, any kind of abuse, think to a lack of nine. And of course, the whole case has to fit it, but think to it. And here's a, a physical uh, hallmark of it. The gums are swollen, ulcerated, deep, and loose from defective nutrition. So if you see somebody that you suspect might have anorexia nervosa or does have it, and they also have these, um, these eruptions, ulcerations in their gum, they might be a very good candidate for lac caninum. All right, so we're gonna do a case for each of our topics. We're gonna do a case today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read it to you, and then we're going to think about what might be an important 
uh, symptoms. So in the chat box, one thing you can do is you can write in what you think is an important symptom and Nada can read it to me and we can discuss whether we think that's a good one or not. And then we'll come up with the remedy together because I've given you all the remedies and I promise you one of the remedies I talked about is going to be used in this case. So an eight-year-old girl came to the clinic with her mother. She looked as though she was three or four years old. She was very malnourished and fragile. Her mother, mother began the case by saying, my daughter doesn't eat anything. When she was two years old, she started to eat by force. Every time we wanted to feed her, we had to grab her hands and put food in her mouth, which she would later vomit back up. As she grew older, we tried to convince her to eat, but the only thing that she ever eats are sour foods and liquids and only four or five spoons of that. Every time we start eating, she complains of a stomachache, a headache, a toothache, or anything she can make up to escape the food. Despite the fact that she doesn't eat anything, she's very energetic. When she comes home from school, she doesn't rest. She's awake until 11 p.m., just jumping around and playing. She continues. She continued by mentioning that she has an older daughter, too, and every time we go out and leave my daughters alone at home, she complains that her younger sister bullies her and forces her to do things by screaming and crying. She never does that in front of us, which makes it difficult for me to believe, but I know my older daughter loves her sister and doesn't lie, so I don't know what to believe. My little one is a good dancer. At parties, she dances in a way that grabs everybody's attention. So does anybody have any thoughts about what is an important thing that I need to put into my case history in order to narrow down the remedy. Anybody have thoughts? I think Nate has disappeared. I'm gonna look in the chat. Can I look in the chat? I'm I'm here. I oh, don't see here. I, I just don't see it. I don't see anything. I see two in the chat and those are Oh, that was you? <laughs> that was me, yeah. All right, so since we don't have any ideas, and that's fine because it's not easy to know what's important and what isn't, let's go through it together piece by piece. So the first one I thought was very important was the fact that she was malnourished because that is very unusual in an eight-year-old girl. So I want to put something into my chart that reflects the fact that she's not hitting milestones that she wants to, uh, that she needs to do and then she doesn't eat anything. I mean, this is, we're always looking for things that are striking in homeopathy. It's one thing not to eat a lot, right? My, my dial door only takes an 800 calories a day or whatever. My daughter doesn't eat anything. That's pretty striking. She can just literally go without eating. But when she finally does eating, eat something, she vomits it back up. She likes sour foods. So this is what we call a craving in homeopathy. And that's very interesting because often what we crave can help us narrow down the remedies because people who tested the remedies had those same cravings. Anything she can make up, okay? It's not important that she complains of a stomachache or a headache or a toothache, it doesn't matter. The mother recognizes it's what she can make up. She's a little scamp, this one, right? She's really clever. She comes up with excuses. She's very, very clever. That's an important part of her uh, emotional makeup. And also she's very restless. She's jumping around and playing all the time and she's a good dancer. And that's honestly, this is a very interesting clue for us in homeopathy because we have some remedies that have an affinity for dancing. So when we put these symptoms together in her chart, we come up with something that looks like this. And we look at all of the things that are all in the yellow, the refuting, refusing to eat, the emaciation, that's the symptom we use for failure to thrive in young children the vomiting of the stomach soon after eating, the desire for lemons, which are sour, the restlessness, and I narrowed it down to children in particular, so I get a remedy that actually has a good track record with children. The deceitfulness, that's the one when she makes up the toothache, that's her cleverness, put that in there as well. And the desire for dancing, and we come up very strongly with tarantula, which is that spider I was telling you about. Remember? Do, 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 do. That's what it reminded us of. And in fact, the remedy given was tarantula 200C, um, and uh, the child did extremely well on it. So I'll take one second to say this is a good time to, if you have any questions to ask, we can do it now or we could do it at the end. If anything comes up, Nita, just interrupt me because I'd rather not just sit and wait here for 30 seconds to find out nothing's coming in. So we'll move on to bulimia nervosa. We've gone through the bulk of you know the history and all that, so we're gonna go through this a bit quicker. So bulimia, again, the word origin, it comes 
from the Greek bulimia, ravenous hunger, okay? Ox hunger. Uh, so in, you actually could have people with anorexia nervosa who have this, uh, this ox hunger, but they control it. So this is how you differentiate from uh, anorexia nervosa. They might have that hunger. The difference is that anorexics control it and bulimia, bulimics give into it. They lose control over it. So anorexics control it, uh, bulimics do the opposite. And the definition in the psychiatric book, there has to be recurrent episodes of binge eating. Remember, it's not enough just to have one or two. And it's characterized by eating in a discrete period of time, okay? It doesn't matter if it's two hours, three hours, 15 minutes, whatever. There's usually a time set aside by the patient, by the person, in order, this is my binging time, okay? And the amount of food that they eat is much, much larger than what any individual would eat in a similar period. So it's not like you sat you know, watched a movie and, and made your way through an entire bag of Cheetos. This is something much more deliberate where food is hoarded and a time is set and it becomes, you know, a special date of the week or of the month or whatever it is where they're going to sit down and eat a ton of food. And it doesn't even have to be, um, it doesn't have to actually be something that they put into their calendar. It could be something triggers them and then they go in the kitchen and then they have already kept, you know, they always a full pantry and they just start plowing through it. Now, what else is characterized by is a sense of lack of control. So they're eating, they're eating, they know that they're eating too much. They know that they're taking in 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 calories, but they have no capacity whatsoever to stop it. Now, a hallmark of bulimia, which we do not see with anorexia, is that they have these what's called compensatory behaviors, these purge behaviors in order to prevent weight gain, okay? You didn't see that with anorexia. It wasn't something that was, um, you, you could make a list of it and this is your ticket off a check mark and they have that, okay, they've got the disorder. In bulimia, there is this checklist of things that they tend to do. One is the self-induced vomiting. One is a misuse of laxatives, diuretics, or other medications. So they are aware that they've taken in far too much food. We're not talking about an anorexic who feels guilty because she had four pieces of lettuce instead of three. We're talking about somebody who's taken in an inordinate amount of food and then does corrective behaviors to prevent the food from metabolizing and causing them to gain weight. There's fasting behavior that they do as well in order to save up the calories for the binge. And then there's excessive exercise deliberately in order to not gain weight. Now, again, with any psychiatric disorder, it has to have uh, a certain period of time and frequency. So at least once a week for three months, they have the same thing as anorexic do. The self-evaluation is unduly influenced by body shape and weight. They look in the mirror and they see something that they don't like, even though we don't see it. And the disturbance does not occur exclusively during episodes of anorexia nervosa. So that's just to understand that there are piece, people with the diagnosis of anorexia nervosa who do exhibit some bulimic behavior, but just in terms of diagnostic criteria, these are not the same thing. Uh, this is its own disorder on its own. It's not anorexia nervosa with a concomitant of some bulimic purge behaviors. It's its own dis uh, disorder. So there's a severity scale, just like we had with the BMI, we could see uh, how mild or moderate or severe it is. So an average of one to three episodes of the compensatory behaviors. Now, it's not the purging, it's not the eating, the binging that is the severity. It is the amount of compensatory behaviors per week that is uh, how it is measured. Then we have 47, 8 to 13, and then extreme. So 14 different, so twice, at least twice a day, the person exhibits these compensatory behaviors in order to prevent themselves from gaining weight. What are some of the behaviors that you see in bulimia nervosa? Well, they do a lot of concealing, right? Just like the anorexic conceal their body with lots of uh, heavy clothing, or they conceal food by shoving it onto a napkin, they also try to conceal their symptoms. I don't know of anybody who brags about the fact that they like to binge on uh, thousands of calories of food in one sitting. So as a result, the binge in, uh, eating typically occurs in secrecy, much as in anorexia, they will eat in secrecy so nobody can see how little that they're eating. In this case, how much that they're eating. So you see the polar polarity of the two disorders. Now the binge eating often continues 
until feeling uncomfortably or even painfully full. A person is aware that their tummy is full. All the chemicals that are sent to your brain, I think ghrelin is one of them, that tells you you are full, you don't need to eat anymore, even though their satiation is in awareness, they continue to eat. What is some of the origins of bulimia nervosa? Again, as a homeopath, that's important. Just like we wanted to understand the origin for the anorexic, we under, want to understand what is driving the bulimia nervosa because it's going to be what we call an ailment from, never well since, some sort of a trauma, some sort, something happened to trigger it. And if we can figure out what that trigger is, we can find a remedy that is known to help heal that kind of shock. So negative affect, so that mean, affect means mood. So uh, you often see that at, um, at the beginning of it, but it's what's causing, right, the depression or the anxiety or the panic or whatever. There's some event that happened that triggered it. There can also just be a, a thought, the internalization of a thin body ideal, but that's important. So when a person says, well, I look at, you know, I look at Ariana Grande and she looks so gorgeous. It's not enough just to understand uh, or to assume that we understand what it is about Ariana Grande that this woman is jealous of, right? Because one person might say, she's got the most gorgeous hair, I've never seen anything like it. Another person might say something entirely different, like she's got this incredible lifestyle and a, and a, and a home that I'll never have. So those are to two totally different areas of jealousy that can be teased out into a, a specific remedy. And of course, interpersonal stressors, of course, everything is about relationships. Dietary restraint can be a trigger as well. In other words, they have uh, starved themselves all week um, and then they feel that they earn, earn the reward of the binge. Negative feelings related to body weight, body shape, and food. That's not surprising. Uh, you can't have a healthy relationship with any of these things and then uh, develop any of these disorders. Boredom has been cited as, as one as well. Uh, people not having anything interesting in their life, they need to have something to look forward to, a project. In this case, for them, the project becomes hoarding food, imagining what the menu will be that day, and putting, uh, putting it together So as a, as a means of uh, eliminating uh, boredom. What are some of the associated features? Well, negative self-esteem and evaluation, as we said before. Now, what's interesting is that the bulimic patient tends to be in the normal weight and sometimes even overweight. So you can have an eating disorder and not be super skinny. So just understand that. It's just because a person says, they say, I, I have it, don't doubt them and don't poo-poo it because they can look actually quite normal. Menstrual irregularities as well, because whenever you're doing putting into your body something inappropriate nutrition-wise, it's gonna have an effect on multiple bodily symptoms. Amenorrhea, not as much. Amenorrhea is the absence of, of menzies, and that tends to be in very, very thin people, but you will have thin bulimics as well. And of course, not surprisingly, you're gonna have fluid and electrolyte disturbances because you are in one sitting, putting enough food in your body as maybe six meals at a time. That's gonna wreak havoc on the, you know, all your sodium and, and, and uh, chlorine and all of your different uh, channels in your body. Now, what are some of the physical consequences of bulimia? When you think about the binging behavior, the shoving food into your body, what can it do to your body? Well, not surprisingly, you can get an esophageal tear because at some point you're some of them, you're almost in a trance state, just putting food into their body and, and not even noticing the size of what, of what they're eating or a chicken bone, right? Not even, you know, just shoving it in without even thinking. Gastric rupture can be another if it goes further down the, the GI tract. Cardiac arrhythmias, we talked about the electrolyte imbalances that could lead to that. Now, teeth erosion is a huge one and the increase in caries in cavities. So look at these teeth, beautiful teeth on top and look at the bottom the uh, jagged edges, the yellow color, the way that the, do you notice how it, it's, it's, it's carved in? You know what that's from? That's from acid, right? Acid is causing the teeth to erode right in front of your eyes. Here's another one, calluses or scars on the dorsal. This is the dorsal surface of the hand. Why is that? Because they're sticking their hand in the mouth to cause them to throw up and they're scraping against their teeth. And then there could be other GI issues. There could be a rectal prolapse 
and then there could be skeletal issues stuff with the bone because it's all related to either nutritional deficiencies or to ipecac abuse remember all those laxatives that they're taking that's going to have an effect on the body over time you just can't get away with it so what are some of the remedies indicated for bulimia nervosa Okay, this is a mineral called Argentum nitricum, and um, I'm going to be giving you some of the hallmark features of these remedies, and you'll see how beautifully they dovetail with bulimia behavior. So a, a hallmark of uh, what we call a keynote of uh, Argentum nitricum is the impulsive behavior. Uh, and they may not know when to stop, is what Richard Pitt says. So we have a lot of symptoms in the proving of our gentleman that come of uh, a sudden impulse to jump from a, a tower or a sudden impulse to, to uh, jump into the river. So even though they know that it could cause them bodily harm, they, they, there was just this feeling like, I just got to do it, I just got to do it. And that's exactly what happens a lot with bulimia, where there's this impulse, something triggers you and I'm just going to go eat and I'm just going to eat my troubles away. So uh, sweets is also a hallmark of Argentum nitricum. They have a tremendous desire for sweets and they have the interesting characteristic that they have the great desire for sweets, even though they know that eating a lot of sweets will make them actually feel sick. So even though they know that when they eat sweets, they are going to feel very sick afterwards, they can't get rid of that desire for it. So this impulsivity represents a losing of control, and that is echoed in the bulimic behavior. So um, I'm just trying to give you some remedies to help you differentiate why one would be good for one person or another. So if you have somebody with uh, this impulsivity is something you're going to see across um, uh, people with bulimia, but if it's overridden by the desire for sweets, you might start to think to Argentum nitricum. Staphysagri is a great remedy for people who uh, they can tend to be mild mannered and they tend to swallow a lot. So the typical, the classic staphysagria is somebody who takes in a lot, takes in a lot, says nothing, says nothing. And then when they finally erupt, they throw things across the floor. They just erupt in anger. And when you think about what is bulimia, it's taking in, taking in, taking in, and then ugh, vomiting it out in this great explosion. So the action of the remedy in general mimics the action of a bulimic person's behavior. They do tend to binge on sweets as well, custardy, creamy things, but that's not as strong as in Argentum nitricum. And another hallmark of them, remember we talked about the jagged teeth, you will see a susceptibility, right? Not everybody, everybody with bulimia is doing the same thing. They're eating too much and they're vomiting, but not everybody gets that tooth erosion. Somebody needing staphysagria will often have more cavities, blackness of the teeth, teeth, brittleness of the teeth, and that would be a good reason to give it over another remedy. Uh, we talked about this, as I, think, I talked about it when I showed you the chart, saccharum album. What is saccharum album? It is sugar. One of the remedies we talked about before, and we'll talk about it again, natural muraticum, it's salt. This is sugar. And somebody named Tina Smith did, took a great interest in these kind of remedies because these are remedies that, uh, these are substances that people uh, eat too much of. We all eat too much sugar. Sugar is in everything. You'd be shocked when you looked at even your can of soup is going to have sugar in it. So he took an interest in it as a remedy. And there's, it's a beautiful remedy for people with eating disorders. And so some of the symptoms you'll see is ravenous appetite soon after eating. That was in the proving of it. Well, lo and behold, that's what you see in SAC album as well. An insatiable appetite accompanied by, and that's what we see in, in bulimics as well, this ravenous appetite. Even though they're eating, they, they, they're still hungry. They need to eat more. The insatiable appetite accompanied by bulimia. So he found it as a good clinical uh, symptom uh, remedy for uh, bulimia. The irresistible desire for sweets. And now, if you think Argentum nitricum wants sweets, that's somebody who really, you know, I really want cake. Okay. This, People who do SAC album, these ends very often children wake up in the morning and the first thing they say is, where's chocolate? I want chocolate. I want sweet. I want sugary cereal. And all day they're bugging their parents for more and more sweets. When you see something so robust like this, think to SAC album. There is often uh, an obesity with the bulimia. So these bulimic patients tend not to be normal weight or even overweight, but they tend to be quite overweight. Now, the origin of it could be someone who's profoundly frustrated in their need for love and affection. 
And so they try to compensate and they're not getting the love that they need. And it's not to say that they're not getting, they're not getting enough love. A lot of children are getting plenty of love from their parents, but some kids need, like, there's just never enough. There's just never enough. You know, we all know people like that. It's just never enough. They just constantly need approval. And these people, they just need so much attention. And there could be something that happens in the family, like the birth of a, of a new child or, or, a. A, a big project at work that's taking away the parents' attention. So it's not a, to impugn the parents that they're not giving the, the child enough love, but this particular child needs a lot of love. This particular adult even needs a lot of love. So they compensate for it with the bulimia. They take in and they take in and take in. Uh, but uh, for people who need sac alb in anorexia, they, they desire it, but then they reject it when it, when it comes towards them. And so you'll see a lot of compensatory behavior in people who need sac alb, and you'll see a lot of smoking. Um, and um, this is a remedy for if you ever know somebody who sucked their thumb until they were seven years old or something, you know, ridiculously longer than they should have, think to sac alb and ask yourself, do they eat a lot of sugar as well? They'll do very well on this remedy. So they'll use the smoking uh, as a way of controlling body weight. So that's that compensatory behavior we talked about. Now, Ignatia, everybody knows Ignatia as the quintessential grief remedy. Uh, of course, it's, it will be an excellent remedy for anorexia nervosa as well. So I gave it a bit of a twist by showing you how it's also very good for bulimia. So you have a lot of hysteria in Ignatia. That's an old word. word. It's not a word I like because it <laughs> derives from uterus. I find it to be a sexist word. But... Um, the idea is that there is a lot of, we've all seen someone who, if we could use the word hysterical, which is like this, <laughs> you know, they can't get to the breath, Some, something terrible has happened and you can't calm them down. You know, you see in the movies, they get a slap across the face in order to calm them down. That's what we mean by the hysteria, the nation. So you see a lot of this spasmodic um, behavior. And so that also echoes the binge eating and vomiting of, of uh, bulimia because that spasm, what happens is the diaphragm goes into spasm as you're, as you're throwing up. So that's why Ignatia can be a very good one because we're looking at symptoms and because there is that spasm, spasms of the muscles in Ignatia, it might be a very good one for uh, bulimia as well. So the origin of it, of course, is grief, shock, uh, disappointment is a huge, huge keynote of, of, uh, of uh, Ignatia, uh, I moved to this new town to be with some friends, and one by one they started dropping me. I I, I gave up my home. I gave it, the, and I'm like I'm so disappointed. I lost I lost my friend. There's the grief. There's the disappointment. There's all of that. Ignatia is a great remedy, and so uh, to uh, give themselves a treat or in order to compensate for the loss, they might fill it up with food. So this might, I put together, a, a, you know, put together some proving symptoms and gave a kind of speculative kind of uh, scenario where Ignatia might be indicated. So you have the origin, the constellation aggravates. So even though they're in grief, they don't really love being there, there, you know, put the arm around and they kind of, you know, they, they push people away, which causes other people to get angry. And so they might seek solace since they're not taking solace in other human beings, they might take solace in food. But then there's that spasmodic tendency, right? So there's also this, they're, they're tormented by remorse for imagined crimes. That's one of the proving symptoms. They, they've done something, they've pushed the person apart, they feel guilty, and then they eat all this food, and then as a result, they uh, spasmodically vomit it up. So that's one you know, kind of case scenario where Ignatia might be indicated. Then we have natural muriatic and that table salt we talked about. Again, Philip Bailey, I'm going to show you the other side of it, how it's effective in bulimia. So natrums bottle up their emotions. And where did we see that before? We saw that with, do you remember? Staphysagria, bottles up the emotions, bottles up the emotion. But the difference is Staphysagria expels it. They reach a certain breaking point and they just vomit it out, right? With natrums, they tend not to, they don't keep it in, thank God, they don't suppress it because that really could lead to a lot of illness when you suppress anything, emotions included. But with them, there's just kind of this constant ooze. They kind of let you know that they're not happy, but they're not being forthright about it and they're also not being violent about it. So they build up an emotional wall. And the reason for that is a lot of the histories of a lot of people needing natrimer is a very difficult childhood where they uh, reached out for love and were rebuffed. And so as a result, they've created a wall between themselves and other people because they're so afraid 
of getting hurt again. Um, a very famous rubric for them is that they don't enjoy sex or sex is painful. It's because they want so much to get close and when they are getting close, they get so afraid that they're gonna get pushed away again that it becomes less than enjoyable for them. So what they're trying to do is fill that void, right? They didn't get the love that they needed. They were rebuffed. There's like this endless hole in their gut that they try to fill up with the food. But of course, no amount of food will be sufficient for somebody uh, who has a, a hole in their stomach from, from deprivation, from emotional deprivation. Nothing will fill that until they get over it emotionally. They, they, do, they work through it, both through some psychotherapy and hopefully through some homeopathic intervention. So the comfort eating progresses in some cases to bulimia. And Bailey said, in my experience, the majority of bulimics are natural. So he said the same thing about anorexic as well. And they generally respond very well to the remedy. I think this is my last remedy. It's pulsatilla, also a very famous one you might know about. Very indicated and mild mannered, meek people. Uh, there's a lot of feelings of low self esteem and timidity in pulsatilla. And uh, when you have that, though, it can lead to very self destructive behaviors. If you don't feel that you are worth something, you will not do things that will. Uh, bring yourself up in society or in the, even in your own mind. You will tend to engage in self-destructive behaviors. So they crave consolation. They're, they're very known. Their key, keynote is clingy. Uh, the child sitting on the mother's lap or the father's lap. Do you love me, daddy? Do you love me? And not just asking once, but over and over again. Tell me why you love me. And, you know, tell me what it is you love about me. That is a very typical pulsatilla type. So they might, if they're not getting that kind of reassurance all the time, they might substitute food uh, instead. Uh, again, we don't look to the physical characteristics of the person to select the remedy. We use it maybe to confirm it. They are inclined to be fleshy and easily excited to tears. I would discount the fleshy one because I've seen plenty of skinny pulsatillas, but the tendency towards weepiness is a hallmark of pulsatilla. So that could be one way for you to know that this person needs pulsatilla over uh, another remedy like Nat Mur, which tends not to cry. They, in fact, a hallmark of it is that I want to cry and I can't. Uh, another uh, well-known um, symptom of pulsatilla is they have a lot of difficulty with fatty foods. Uh, it's not so much that they crave them, they can eat them because they'll get sick from it. And so uh, they might have a craving for it, but they will eventually throw it up because they just can't keep it in their stomachs. And uh, there actually is a, a rubric, a symptom in our uh, repertorizations with deliberate vomiting in order to stay slim. You can't get more clear about a bulimic symptom than that. And there aren't a lot of remedies associated with it, but pulsatilla is. So I'm gonna end my talk with another case. And once again, it was in the, um, uh, the list that I just gave you. So let's see if you can figure it out. So this is a woman who's 60 years of old and she's been obese all of her life. And she has an irresistible desire to eat chocolate, cakes, and sweets. No matter how much she eats, she never feels satisfied. And she continues to eat even though her stomach is full. She's been throwing herself dessert parties every week at the end of the work week for over 30 years. She lives for them, even severely limiting her food intake for two days before so that her stomach is empty and to try not to gain more weight, right? Those compensatory behaviors. So she deserves the diagnosis of bulimia nervosa, but what remedy does she need? She said that as a child, her brother got all of the attention, and so she would throw herself on the floor or kick and hit him in revenge. She started hoarding chocolate bars and constantly demanded sweets from her parents. She sucked her thumb until the age of 14 years old, and she feels that her body, which she hates, has prevented her from finding a partner, and she feels alone much of the time. So we have obesity, strong desire for sweets, so, oh, kicking of the jealousy of the, of the brother. I don't know that I talked about that, but I'll show you in the chart that this is part of the remedy. Hoarding chocolate, so just this constant need for sweets, demanding sweets, sucking her thumb until the age of 14 years old. That's pretty striking. Hates her body, feels alone much of the time. Anybody remember? There we go, sack out of our sugar. So we see all of the... Um, symptoms that I just mentioned to you. You can see them. Mind kicks, mind striking. That's the thing that she was doing with her brother. 
uh, that jealousy, discontented with herself, desire for sweets, feeling of being neglected is a very big one in Sac Al. Remember, we talked to you about the child who's constantly demanding love. Even if there's a lot of love coming her way, even though she's getting it, she feels that she's being neglected or he's being neglected. And so Sac Alb was given in this case at a very high dose. Uh, this is what Tina Smits uh, recommends a lot for Sac Alb. We just give it a really strong dose of 1M and the child did extremely, extremely well. So that's the end of my talk. These are my slides. These are my references that I used. And um, I just want to thank you for being such a great audience. I see, uh, I can kind of see that there have been some questions. I'm sure Nada will do a wonderful job getting those to me. And I'm going to, um, shall we, I won't show the next slide yet, right? Nada, will, you'll tell me when to put that up. We'll do this one for now. Yeah, yeah. This then is we have the next one and then you'll tell me when to put it up. Yeah, I will. Did you want the questions right now? Um, I, I can't think of anything else I'd like to do right now. <laughs> okay, so a couple of questions from Nicole. I'm wondering what to expect with anorexia or bulimia with a remedy. How quickly will remedy act and what do we expect to see change and how quickly? Okay, that's a really good question because For Homeopathy Canada is so involved with treating acutes. And when you're dealing with uh, a bruise that just happened, if you're dealing with um, a cold, a flu, anything that resolves very quickly, you're gonna to expect to see very quick results. As I said, we went a little bit outside of the box today. We are dealing with um, a disorder that has taken many, many months, if not years to develop. And consequently, it's going to take some time to resolve. That being said, if it is the correct remedy, you should expect to see some amelioration in the symptoms within the first, I will stretch it to a month, but you would probably start to see them sooner than that. You're not gonna see a cure. You're not going to see a person suddenly start putting on weight, but slowly, slowly, we're going to start eroding, you know, all the layers of what is it that is causing the person to have this issue. That's going to take time. And uh, very often, you don't all, 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 always need it with homeopathy, but there's something that triggered it. There's something, whether in the home or the school or whatever, sometimes you're going to need a concomitant intervention, such as a psychotherapy, maybe a family psychotherapy, because unless you remove the trigger for it, if there is fighting in the household, if their child is being put down all the time by one of the parents or by somebody at school is bullying them and they keep going back for more of that, there's only so much the remedy can do. But if they keep getting triggered, you know, we tell you not to use essential oils when you're having homeopathy because it can antidote it. Well, this is an emotional antidote. You go home, and you go start getting treated the same way you always have been, you're antidoting the remedy. So very often you'll have to take the remedy every day, but it will not maybe work as deeply or as quickly as it could because you're being constantly exposed to the trigger. So there's a lot of things that go into answering that question about how quickly it will work. Thanks, Robin. And Nicole is also curious, in the case of the child with anorexia, whether there is a possible cause or etiology as the child was so young. I think the child was two. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, and I've been asked before, you know, what would you see more, anorexia or bulimia in a young child? And uh, my, my, IH, my thoughts on that um, are that we learn at a very young age. I think we even learn before we have the concept of like really good, strong cognition and ideation that food is something that is important to our caregiver. So imagine being fed, you know, open the mouth and the child opens the mouth and the food goes in. And what does the parent do? You're such a good boy. You're such a good girl. Don't you have a good appetite? Oh, you're making mommy so happy. I mean, we've all done it, right? We, we put pleasure around the concept of food. So the child, and then when the child has had enough or the child's in a bad mood and tries to feed the, the uh, try to get fed and the mother tries or the father tries to put the food into the mouth and, and the child goes, no. And the parent gets flustered. And oh, why are you being a bad boy? Why don't you make mommy happy? And child learns very, very early that there is the capacity to control somebody else through food. So my hunch is with that child is she learned very early that she can control her. She has no control over her mother otherwise, 
right? Or through the parents or the family, whatever was going on, but she could do it through food. She could get maybe, she, or it could also be that she was somebody who needed a lot of attention. And she saw that when she didn't eat, everybody fussed over her, right? And so there's just this constant worry. They're constantly talking about her. They're taking her to doctors. They're taking, you know, they're, they're, they're spending a lot of time with her. And she might have been jealous because a new baby came in the family. There's, so there's all these things. There could be, that's why it's so important to understand the etiology. So it's such a great question, Nicole. Thank you for it. Because through that question, we start to dig deeper as to what might have caused it. And when we start to understand what might have caused it, we can find the remedy to match it. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, some of you are asking about slides. I uh, want to let you know that the webinar in its entirety will be available in a few days at uh, forhomeopathycanada.org. So you can pick it up there. Yeah. So what I would do, yeah, we don't make the slides available, but what I would, you know, um, uh, I have my name at the bottom, so they are mine. I would ask you to, you know, to respect my, my, my intellectual property. But um, you can always take um, uh, screenshots. That's what I do when I watch other webinars and then I put them into a folder and they're for my own private study later at another time. So you're more than welcome to do that. And um, you saw at the beginning, uh, my, my website, uh, my, my company is called Har Harmonious Homeopathy. So you can always write to me at harmonioushomeopathy. You can go to the website and you can write to me through there. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, we have one. Oh, some people are saying thank you. No questions. Thank you. Lots of thank you yous. My goodness, thank you so much. Beautiful night in Canada, at least it is in Toronto. Thank you for taking some time with me. Thank you. Another spectacular, wonderfully interesting webinar, Robin. So you just hit it out of the park every time. Thank you. Okay. It's my pleasure. And I, we've always asked this, you know, um, I think you can see if you've been following for homeopathy Canada. I think this is my third one for, you know, out of eight or something. So uh, it might be that there's too much of me and that's fine. And I understand that's great, but I love to teach. I love to put slide sets together. If you have anything that you want covered, whether it's by me or someone else, please, please, please let us know. And we'll be, uh, as long as we feel it's appropriate for for homeopathy Canada, we will be delighted to cover it for you. Okay. Speaking of which, Here's one, because guess what? We're all starting to leave our homes and we're gonna need this. We're going outside. Yes, so our next uh, webinar is on Wednesday, July 8th, and it is on sports injuries and how homeopathy can alleviate those. And uh, yeah, so you could register for that at For Homeopathy Canada as well. This is going to be a really, really great one, guys, because we're going back to our roots of doing more acute illnesses. In this case, these are more like conditions. And so strains and sprains and wound repair and all that kind of stuff, uh, things that you can bring in your kit with you when you go off and play tennis or go jogging or go on your bike. Uh, always carry your arnica with you. I can't tell you that enough. Bring your arnica with you, uh, especially if you've hit your head because it's the premier um, concussion remedy. So Jude will talk all about that. So this is going to be a really, really great one. Oh, one more for you, Nita. Yeah, and we have to remember that we must share for the win. So we do a draw of our uh, people who have submitted testimonials that previous month. So if you send in a testimonial uh, your homeopathy success story this month, at the end of the month, we will Sorry. Perhaps draw your name and uh, the prize this month is just a deluxe homeopathic kit from HomeoCan. Our prizes yes. are spectacular and yeah, that's uh, yeah we, we want you to share for the win. We want your story. So please send them in. You can send them to me, nada at hands.org. You know, what, guys, this is a win-win. I mean, we've been asking for testimonials for a long time. We're going to continue to because nothing convinces people who don't. And especially if you were a skeptic, all, even better, but that doesn't matter. You don't need to be a skeptic. The story, we want to hear your story, how you used homeopathy, because this will help spread the word of homeopathy throughout the world. So it's a win-win. Not only do you get to share your story uh, and win a prize, uh, you get to help uh, the ex gain the acceptance of homeopathy throughout the world. So we really, really, really ask you to send in your testimonials. And if you don't have one, if you know someone who does, please 
tell them about us and we would love to hear your story. Absolutely. And if you don't feel like writing it, send us a video testimonial. Everything's welcome. Even better. Yeah. And give us permission to put it on our website. You're gold. Exactly. Are we doing that yet? Have we I started think, doing video? Uh, we haven't had any submissions, but we'd love to. So send them on in. It's your opportunity to shine. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Well, I think that's it. Thank you to all of you who participated and um, a special thank you to you, Robin. And uh, thanks, David. Take good care, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. See you in about a month.